Charles Finney and Decisional Regeneration. As you may recall, if you've seen the videos before, I had them up, but I've taken them down so that I can update them and put some new research into them. Not that any of the stuff on there was wrong, but I've got some new stuff that I think you're going to find very interesting. The series was in reply to a video that Lane C.H. had posted on YouTube called Salvation is the Work of Man. It was in quotation marks as though it were uh, a quotation from Charles Finney. His video had material from both himself and this teacher named Mark Keeler. And Keeler gets his information from Michael Horton. None of these guys like Charles Finney. They're very radical Calvinists. So since my series was up originally, Lane C.H. had received a slew of complaints from Christians who challenged him. Uh, why have you got this thing saying that it's a quote from Charles Finney when Charles Finney never said that? Lane C.H. removed the quotation marks, but now he's saying that it's just a paraphrase of something that Finney had said. Here's Lane C.H.'s statement on his video at present. No doubt he might change it again in the future, instead of removing the offensive video. He says, did you read that? Think about that paraphrased quote for a second. It's an absolute contradiction to what the Bible says. I'm kind of curious as to which statement Finney said was being paraphrased. It's proper to cite your sources. Now, it's not a paraphrase if it's not really rewording another author's ideas and thoughts. When Lane posted the video, the statement was in quotes. By changing a fraudulent false quote, into a paraphrase, it's still a lie from Lane C.H.'s part. Lane has still exaggerated or misrepresented some kind of source, if the source was actually there. He doesn't provide the, the reference for the so-called paraphrase. That's a, a red flag. A straw man fallacy is actually being committed here. There's a very fine line between paraphrasing someone and committing a straw man fallacy. A straw man fallacy seriously undermines one's integrity in logical discourse because you're just painting uh, a caricature, a cartoon of what this person's views are, and you're shooting it down because it's easier to shoot down a cartoon than it is to actually understand the person's thoughts. So again, the material that Lane C.H. presents, it's his material, the material of Mark Keelar, who ultimately gets his stuff from Michael Horton, who was very strongly biased against Charles Finney. Today we're going to look at only one of the videos that Lane C.H. has posted. The piece is called Salvation is the work of man. So here, Mr. Mark Keeler, he says that the modern day use of altar calls, or what he also calls decisional regeneration, is a method that was introduced by Charles Finney to the church in the year 1820. So let's roll the clip and see what Keeler says here. Completely foreign to the church until his contemporary in the 1800s, Charles Finney introduced it. That was in 1820. Folks, that's less than 200 years ago. This is very interesting concerning the fact that Finney was only converted in 1821, on October 10th. Now, we learn this from his memoirs on page 16. That's from the unabridged version that I've got by Rosalind Dupuy. And he was only licensed uh, in 1823, and he did not become an itinerant evangelist until 1824, and that's on page 63. So what people call the altar call today has some similarities with a procedure uh, which Finney called the anxious seat. 
But Finney claims to have never used the anxious seat, except in very rare instances, before the Rochester revival in 1830. In fact, Finney states that he called the people to rise up or to take to stand from their seats rather than come forward. In one instance of this where he called people to rise to their feet was in his first revival at Evans Mills in 1824. And you find that on pages 63 to 65. Again, Keila goes. Perhaps you'd be surprised to find out that the father of decisional regeneration, the man who invented the process, Charles Finney himself. Here, again, Keeler calls Finney the father of decisional regeneration who invented the process. So you see, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Which is why, in his review of Finney's writings called Lectures on Revival, Professor Dodd stated this about altar calls. Listen. One can search the volumes of church history for a single example of this practice before the 1820s, and the search will be in vain. Say what? It wasn't there before the 1820s? That's correct. That's correct, and I, I would encourage you to go back and check church history on that. Keeler quotes Dr. Albert Dodd, a Princeton Calvinist, uh, who says that altar calls did not exist before the 1820s. And then Keeler, he asks the audience to check church history on that. Well, we don't want to disappoint Mr. Keeler, so let's do that. Anne Taves, in her book, Fits Trances and Visions, on page 101 here, she's quoting Robert Todd. It was the Reverend Chandler Todd says, who in 1799 first invited awakened sinners to leave their places in the congregation to come forward and kneel at the altar or communion rail. Not only that, we'll take a look at uh, Dennis Carroll's extensive uh, website uh, containing Finney materials uh, called gospel.net. This man named Stuart wrote, this method was already in use before before Finney ever utilized it. Timothy Smith explains that if anyone's to be credited with its invention, it's the Methodists. Devised about 1808 in a crowded New York City chapel to enable saints to deal with seekers more conveniently. And then there's the revivalist Asahel Nettleton, who was a contemporary of Finney's and later turned into a nemesis of Finney because Finney started becoming more popular. He spearheaded campaign against Finney, leading a lot of the main ministers of New England against Finney. And now these uh, ministers were Calvinists, and this led to what was called the New Lebanon Convention. Now, do you think that the issue of altar calls, or protracted meetings, or, or inquirer meetings, or the anxious seat, or the mourner's bench, do you think that these things were issues uh, that they brought against Finney at that time? No, because many of these leading New England old school Calvinists and new school Calvinists, they were using the same methods. This issue never came up. You know what came up in those in the New Lebanon Convention? Calling women to pray publicly. That's what these Calvinistic ministers were upset with Finney about. They thought that the meetings were disorderly, but not once did they ever blame Finney for using altar calls? So Asa Held Nettleton, Spurgeon. Now the other one is W.B. Sprague. In 1832, Sprague wrote a book called Lectures on Revivals of Religion, not to be confused with Finney's book of the same name, which came out a few years later. And no doubt Sprague's book influenced Finney's Lectures on Revivals of Religion. Now, Sprague was an old-school Calvinist. In that book, the title of chapter 5 is General Means of Producing and Promoting Revivals. In this chapter, he advocates that ministers in these revivals or evangelistic campaigns use the same kind of methods that Finney later used. It's point 6. The last means for promoting a revival, which I shall notice, is an exercise designed particularly for awakened 
sinners. It's generally admitted, I believe, by those who are friendly to revivals, that there should be some occasion on which persons of this class should be distinctly addressed, and which by bringing them together as inquiring souls may serve in a measure to get them over their indecision and commit them to a course of successful striving to enter in at the straight gate. Though special care should be taken that this act of commitment is not perverted to yield aliment to a self-righteous spirit, a conviction that no better course could be adopted at the close of a public service in which God's truth has been exhibited and enforced. Let those who have been impressed by it and who wish to have their impressions deepened and to be instructed in reference to their duty and salvation be requested to remain after the rest of the assembly have retired. And then let the minister or some other competent person address them earnestly and affectionately in reference to their peculiar condition. And let the particular state of each mind be ascertained and let each receive appropriate counsel and instruction. In all this, there's nothing ostentatious, nothing which peculiarly exposes to self-deception. Well, yet the individual commits himself as truly as he could by any more public act to cherish his serious impressions and places himself in a condition in which the prayers of Christians and scriptural instruction and counsel are effectually secured to him. I do not say that some different course may not appeal more strongly to the passions, but I confess that I know of none which seems to me better adapted to impress upon the conscience and heart Bible truth, and thus subserve a genuine revival of religion. So here, Sprague, in his book, this is coming from an old school Calvinist, before Finney even used the same method himself. So if anything, Finney is not the father of decisional regeneration. It's clear that Calvinists used it even before Finney did. That is Christian history. And I've also given you the references. Not like Lane C.H.